Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. As we wait for a few more people to join us, um, I will very briefly go through the accessibility services that we are providing today. We are aiming to make this webinar uh, inclusive, so we are providing English live captions. Uh, in order to access these live subtitles, you need to click on the closed caption CC button that you see at the bottom of the screen on the black bar if you're joining uh, through a computer. If you're joining through a smartphone, you may need to click on the three dots at the bottom of uh, the screen and I believe click on view full uh, transcript. Today, we are also going to be providing international sign language. You can find the interpreters on video uh, in the participants list. Remember to pin the video. This means to make sure that the video remains displayed on your screen at all times. To do that, you need to click on the three dots that you see on the video and then click on pin. We are also providing simultaneous interpretation into Arabic, French and Spanish. To access the interpretation, you need to click on the glow button that you see at the bottom of the screen next to the closed caption button. Um, if you click on it, you'll see English, French, Spanish and Arabic as uh, language options. If you do not see Arabic, it might be that you're not, uh, you do not have the latest Zoom version installed. So you might want to disconnect, install the new version and then connect again. Uh, just select the language of preference and if you are fine with English, you don't need to do anything, just keep it off. Uh, if you're having any issues, just write us in the chat. We have Jonathan and Tristan monitoring the chat and we'll try to help you as best as uh, best that we can. Um, let's now very quickly go through some housekeeping rules. Uh, it goes without saying, but please uh, keep your microphone mute when you're not speaking. Again, if you have any problems or if you'd like to ask a question, just write it in the chat. Um, you may also want to write in languages other than English. We'll do our best to translate them and then raise your questions with the facilitators. Uh, it would be really, really helpful for us if you could please fill in the evaluation form after the webinar is over, because this is a, going to be a very good way for us to learn about our performance and, and improve for the future. Uh, just finally, uh, remember that this webinar is being recorded. We'll make the recording available as well as the presentation at the link that you find at the bottom. Well, enjoy the webinar. Thanks again for connecting. And I am now going to leave the floor to the co-facilitator and Sphere Director Balwan Singh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. A very good morning, uh, good afternoon or a good evening depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to this Sphere webinar, which explores why humanitarian standards matter in the COVID-19 response. It is part of an initiative on applying humanitarian standards to the global COVID-19 response. The aim is to build the capacity and understanding of humanitarian actors on relevant humanitarian standards. And these include the Sphere standards, the core humanitarian standard, and the Humanitarian Standards Partnership Standards. Now this webinar is the final in a series of seven webinars this year, which present current and emerging guidance, including the guidance which was issued by Sphere in March of this year. The webinars also signpost participants to available resources and share good practice examples from community-led responses. So far, we have had five regional webinars covering Southeast Asia, South Asia, DRC in Africa, the Middle East and North Africa region, and also South America. And we had a thematic webinar on palliative care last week. Today, we will explore why humanitarian standards matter for COVID-19, drawing on a range of community and global perspectives. Now, we are very fortunate to have a range of speakers and panelists with immense depth and breadth of experience to share with us. The webinars are delivered in a partnership, which includes Sphere, the CHS Alliance, the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, ASB, and many global and local partners. And we have had some 1,700 participants, including today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Manisha Thomas, who will co-facilitate this webinar. Manisha has worked and consulted on humanitarian issues for over 20 years. 
She is the Geneva representative of the Women's Refugee Commission. Previously, she worked with the Emergency Appeals Alliance, the Association of International uh, Development Agencies in Palestine, the Interagency Standing Committee Secretariat, and the International Council of Voluntary Agencies. Manisha, over to you now. Thank you very much, Balwant, and welcome to everyone for this final webinar, which we hope will be exciting for you and it's gonna be fun for us, I think. I'm briefly just going to walk you through what the objectives are for the webinar. And you can see there that we really want to share how communities have harnessed humanitarian standards to build their resilience to COVID-19, highlight how SPHERE, the core humanitarian standard, and the other humanitarian standards have enabled and supported COVID-19 responses. We also want to explore how global perspectives promote quality and accountability at local levels. And finally, we want to hear from you. So we want to elicit some examples and challenges that you have faced in terms of promoting further learning, uh, to promote further learning. So we have a, a relatively packed agenda, but we've got an excellent lineup of speakers. Once uh, I stop speaking, we're going to move into the first part of our session, which is we're going to hear from three speakers on people and communities, humanitarian standards and resilience. We're then going to open up the floor to Q&A uh, from you, but you're, as Barbara said, feel free to put questions into the chat box. We'll be monitoring those and we'll be able to pose those to our different speakers. We'll then turn to the second part of our webinar, which is looking at global perspectives and local realities. And that's gonna be a panel discussion with four speakers. And then we'll come back again to you for Q and A, and then we'll have some closing reflections on humanitarian standards matter. And then we'll close at 3.30 promptly Geneva time. We're also going to make sure that you are engaged in our webinars. So what we are going to do is start off with a short poll to sort of see, make sure that you're able to interact with our Zoom platform, but that you're also telling us where you're joining us from. So you should be able to see a poll coming up on your screens now. If you're on your phone, you may need to kind of type, uh, click the three buttons. Otherwise, Jonathan is already posting the questions in the chat box, so you can just type your answers there. I'm hoping that everyone is seeing the poll. So you just click on which region you're based in, and that way we have a sense of everyone's participation from where they're coming, and who's up really early and who's up really late in the world. Give you a couple of sec minutes to just fill that in, please. So far, Europe seems to be the most well-represented, already at 45% of our participants. Well, we've had, yeah, there we go, 68% voting. That's great. So we have a majority of people joining us from Europe. Maybe Barbara, Tristan, you can share the poll with everyone so they can see. You can see we've got 41% from Europe with the second most represented is Asia, followed by Africa, then Central and South America, North America, the Middle East being Second to last, in Australia, Oceania. That's very late, so welcome to that person who's awake very late at night. We hope it's going to be a fun day for you. So that's just to get you warmed up for the webinar. And now I'm going to pass back to Balwant, who's going to introduce our first speaker on our first session on people and communities, humanitarian standards and resilience. Thanks. Balwant, please. Thank you very much, uh, Manisha. Uh, now in this session, we will hear how humanitarian standards harness and build on the resilience of people and communities. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Eliasu Adamu. Eliasu is the sphere focal point in Niger and has extensive experience and knowledge of quality and accountability across West and Central Africa. He has worked with humanitarian NGOs for more than 20 years. Eliasu is an agricultural engineer by background and held management posts in agricultural valorization and natural resources management with the Niger Ministry of Agriculture for 25 years. Eliasu, I invite you to share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Merci, uh, Manisha. Merci, 
et Balouent. Oui, merci beaucoup. J'appelle donc depuis le Niger. En matière de participation communautaire, de renforcement de la résilience communautaire, ce qu'il faut noter, c'est que du point de vue des principes, tout part normalement des principes humanitaires, notamment la charte humanitaire avec le droit de vivre dans la dignité, le droit à une assistance humanitaire et le droit à la sécurité. Et donc, les interventions en matière euh, humanitaire euh, vont sur le principe qu'il faut, faut d'abord donner la parole aux gens, il faut écouter les communautés, il faut travailler pour les comprendre, il faut euh, en particulier comprendre le contexte et souvent dans ce contexte, il y a toute une série de rumeurs euh, qui se développent et qui font que quelque part la participation communautaire est inhibée et souvent même elle se transforme en risque pour les acteurs humanitaires. Et donc il faut travailler pour rétablir les relations de confiance avec les communautés. Il faut susciter, si vous voulez, l'engagement communautaire. Et ça, ce qui permet aux humanités de le faire, c'est justement la charte humanitaire, les principes de protection, mais c'est aussi surtout la norme humanitaire fondamentale de qualité et de redevabilité notamment euh, si on prend les exemples de l'engagement numéro 3, l'engagement numéro 4 qui est, est, demande à ce que les communautés euh, aient accès à une information à temps, l'engagement numéro 5 qui dispose que les communautés euh, disposent de mécanismes sûrs et réactifs qui leur permettent de dire leur point de vue sur la réponse et sur la crise. Et donc, quelque part, c'est tous ces, ces principes-là qui est donc permettent de susciter l'engagement communautaire et c'est cet engagement communautaire qui est un facteur d'amélioration de la qualité et de la redevabilité de l'intervention, d'autant plus qu'on crée l'espace aux communautés, on les écoute, on sait ce qu'ils veulent, comment est-ce qu'ils le veulent, quand ils le veulent et on appuie en ce moment, simplement on, on développe un plan d'action qui va se baser sur un plan de communication. Une fois qu'on a rétabli la confiance, on s'est compris et qui va permettre aussi de donner l'espace aux communautés qui vont engager avec les acteurs humanitaires un certain nombre d'actions dont les communautés seront même les porte-parole et les maîtres de l'action. Et on a vu euh, dans certains chantiers humanitaires, notamment lors de la riposte contre le COVID-19 dans certains pays de l'Afrique centrale, notamment en RDC, qu'à euh, partir du moment où la confiance est installée avec les communautés, les communautés euh, donnent l'information, elles font du fort en fort, elles font des, de, de, de la sensibilisation, euh, de la démonstration et qui permet qu'elles pardon de faire en sorte que les communautés s'approprient de l'action, il faut à la limite, disons, simplement donner la voix aux communautés, leur permettre de dire ce qu'elles pensent, mais en particulier, l'action humanitaire doit simplement donner l'espace aux gens, permettre aux gens d'agir, aux communautés d'agir, et nous, humanitaires, on doit simplement appliquer les recommandations de ce faire, notamment renforcer la communauté, et en particulier pour le cas de COVID, on s'est rendu compte que euh, le fait que euh, les acteurs humanitaires, ils, ils ont appliqué les standards WASH, les standards de santé, et en particulier lorsqu'on dit qu'il faut renforcer les systèmes de santé existants, cela a permis de conférer de la, de la résilience aux communautés et qui ont vite compris et qui ont quelque part euh, pris le relais de l'action. Et, et du coup, donc, ça a permis aux communautés de l'avoir de l'espace, de démontrer leurs compétences, d'avoir confiance aux acteurs humanitaires. Et c'est quelque part euh, le suivi, l'alignement par rapport aux au standards qui permettent donc d'aboutir à un meilleur engagement communautaire qui est porteur donc de résilience communautaire. Merci beaucoup. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Iliasu. Really appreciate your perspectives of really working with communities and reinforcing standards. It's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Ms. Diana Hiscock, who is the Global Disability Advisor for HelpAge International. She also represents CBM Global on the Humanitarian Standards Partnership Steering Committee. In recent years, Diana has been actively engaged in the development, dissemination, and use of the humanitarian inclusion standards with other standards and guidelines across the sector 
to better ensure the inclusion of those of persons with disabilities in humanitarian responses. Diana, I pass the floor to you, please. Thank you, Manisha. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so uh, thank you for the previous speaker, very interesting. So my, my privilege to join the platform here is to highlight the way um, standards um, the, uh, from the um, HSP um, have been used in COVID responses. And as well as that, I'll try to highlight some of the challenges we're facing. Um, we do appreciate the important timing of this webinar to reinforce our continuing engagement with SPHERE. In a time of the increasing challenges in supporting to communities to reduce risk and resilience. Um, could you just put the slide up? Is that there, please? Thank you. So just to reinforce for those who may not be familiar, the, the HSP standards are child protection, education, livestock and livelihood, market analysis, economic recovery, and the humanitarian inclusion standards. And it really, they are so relevant now to the COVID response, um, not only in displacement settings, but even at national response planning. And I think it's, uh, we have a, a strong voice here with, through the Sphere platform to better engage across um, different platforms to, to strengthen the, the value of aligning um, the, 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 the standards in, into different developments as we move along to becoming more resilient. Um, I would say it's difficult to ignore, ignore their contribution at this time when looking at the topics um, that are covered as I just mentioned and, and we're, we're adapting to the work all of us are to help teams on the ground to contextualize the guidance to meet their local reality and that's actually a, a very big piece of learning that we we maybe need to more reflect on and it's been a very big learning curve for us all. Um, however the reality of the COVID response in, in, in our work um, has led to many challenges by nature of the blanket response to save lives and protect communities. Um, and we've had such a lack of consultation um, as expressed in the previous speaker, that's so important. And we've found that a lot of people are left challenged to understand how best to manage their daily lives. So as we move, move forward, the, the learning from trying to push um, the value added um, coming from using the standards, we, we've, we've really noticed there's a dramatic increase in um, people, different people being stigmatized and discriminated. Um, and I can speak uh, on behalf of older men, and women, men and women, boys and girls with disabilities have, have been really excluded throughout the pandemic. And we need to do better to, to better address um, our, our inclusion lens. Um, and from, from my lens, from working on the humanitarian inclusion standards, um, we have a lot more work to do. We've also found a lot of risk messaging tended to be blanketed and was not considering um, access accessibility for all, unlike this webinar, which is incredibly accessible um, and, and a good model that we need to, to look at. The lack of attention also we've, we've recognized on the growing mental health issues across the sectors uh, that are commonly um, reported and um, realized is also something we need to build better into our response plans. And, um, building that into the, some of the guidance in, in our work has been um, a learning curve that we can, we can build on. Um, the, the, just the last point really, the, the pandemic restrictions puts pressure on people's incomes and livelihoods and, and changing un, uncertain daily routines for many have increased a lot of violence, abuse and neglect within families and communities and um, support within our standards also has been um, strengthened in many, in many ways in, in our work. So just to, to final point is for me, the um, positive learning that's come out of this very difficult time um, is that we've increased our networks both globally and locally in humanitarian sectors. And it's the, the, the drive to um, promote the use of humanitarian standards partnership with Sphere is bringing new opportunities to learn um, and share to build on um, building back better in this new context. We, we see it's a very timely, um, well, it's a very good time to encourage more opportunities to build back one of our strategic directions in training with new networks online and use the digital platforms that Sphere is promoting um, to, to see if we can build on and adapt our responses and resilient plans for the future. So I think that's um, just from some initial words and I'll finish there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Diana. Uh, now, to build on, on what Diana has covered, our next speaker is Shumon Sengupta, 
uh, Shumon directs a consortium delivering essential health for the disadvantaged in Bangladesh. He has 25 years of experience in development and humanitarian programs, including the Ebola response in Sierra Leone and also the current COVID-19 response. Previously, he was regional representative for Engender Health and also country director with Save the Children and Murray Stopes International in both Asia and Africa. Shumon, uh, over to you to share your insights and experience uh, with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Balwan, for the generous uh, introduction. Without much ado, uh, at the outset, I would like to say that as uh, development partners, we have realized the importance of humanitarian standards even more strongly in our COVID response. In particular, the need to avoid exposure to harm the need for timeliness and for better coordination and uh, protection. Having been involved in the Ebola emergency response in West Africa, I found many commonalities, uh, uh, although the challenges in COVID-19 response is even more staggering. And given limitations of mobility, uncertainties of supply chains and constraints posed by uh, uh, the need for infection prevention and control, it's become even more difficult to meet all standards fully. In my brief presentation, I will share three challenges that we have faced and how we have tried to overcome these and ensure that we remain accountable to beneficiaries in uh, concern worldwide. We prefer to call them program uh, participants as well as communities. So the first challenge has been um, to ensure adequate community engagement and feedback. feedback. Uh, for this, we have tried, uh, we have trained our field workers so that they can engage in the field while protecting themselves and communities. We do not want at any cost to expose communities and beneficiaries to risks and cause more harm. So training on infection prevention and control was key and ensuring supplies of appropriate personal protective equipment and disinfectants was essential. And, and very, very importantly, when we started doing this retraining for our field teams, we once again reminded them of the sphere, sphere standards and to be, out, be on the lookout for any potential violations. And we had to develop special checklists to see whether we are meeting these standards or not. Of course, we met many, we didn't meet some, and I'll discuss that. The second challenge was that there was a lot of there were a lot of rumors and uh, misinformation in the communities about COVID-19. For example, the notion that it was an airborne and waterborne infection, and this led to conflicts in community water distribution points. Another misconception led to high demand and consumption of chloroquine and antibiotics, as a result of which uh, it created morbidities, but also these drugs vanished from the shelves overnight and stigma of those testing positive or even showing symptoms of cough and fever was also very high. We had to act very quickly and along with our partners, we developed a strategy to give correct information to people in local language. We inter interacted with mother's care groups and youth groups and encouraged them to narrate their personal stories. So uh, hence, we got very valuable insights from them about rumors and misconceptions circulating in the community, as well as their fears and concerns and what their immediate needs were. We also, we took the opportunity to make them aware of the basic facts in simple language and how they should protect themselves, their households and communities. So there was a two-way communication in which we learned as much from the communities as they learned from our field workers. And very importantly, we took these opportunities to remind them of their rights and what they should normally expect from our field teams. We also shared the toll-free number for feedback and complaint. So to give an example, one of the feedback we received, uh, we got, uh, was that women were not getting access to antenatal care services and neonatal care. Institutional deliveries had almost gone down or had gone down dramatically. So, and this leads me to the third challenge, which is of declining access uh, and utilization of essential healthcare service, which we consider as one of their basic rights. So to address this, we provided access to safe telemedicine services to communities by setting up uh, telemedicine booths next to healthcare facilities so that they don't, didn't have to get into the health facility for basic health care and could receive advice, including referral for a COVID-19 RT-PCR test if necessary. We launched a micro health insurance scheme in which extreme poor and disadvantaged people could get essential health care services through available private sector health providers and NGO clinics. For the first six months of the pandemic, the premium for this micro health insurance was free. 
and we used mobile phones to send out messages and provide a toll free number so that people could call back and give their feedback or complaints to a central office for remedial action to give a very good example a story if you like we received a complaint from the community that they had to make a payment for the free health insurance scheme which they were not supposed to make they were not supposed it was supposed to be free so this enabled us to take quick action and investigate the issue and take necessary corrective action thus despite the challenges we were able to ensure a minimum level of accountability to beneficiaries and communities in our covid response in order to increase accountability to of duty bearers we are working closely with local authorities health facility management committees and community groups to gauge availability accessibility and utilization of basic healthcare service this is our means of ensuring better greater accountability of different duty bearers the nature of the pandemic has made it particularly difficult to meet sphere standards as much as it has become absolutely necessary to try and meet them to the maximum extent possible so we have not given up as mentioned earlier we have tried out alternate solutions through community groups and through digital platforms to engage and get feedback from communities in order to improve accountability so i will end my presentation by saying uh, thanks to sphere for keeping us on our toes thank you very much Thank you so much, Shuman, and thank you to all three speakers. You've really provided us with some excellent examples of how you've been able to respond during the COVID times crisis and ensuring that humanitarian principles and standards are being respected while really working with communities, but then also identifying a number of lessons that we really need to be taking into consideration. We now have the chance to open up the floor to you in the audience for any questions or comments that you may have. And you can either raise your hand and we can give you the floor, or we can also take your questions from the chat box. There was already a comment earlier on about how, whether we admit it or not, refugee camps are not well treated which maybe is something that somebody would like to have a, a reflection on one of our speakers. But please, if there's anyone in the audience who has any questions or comments, please ask away. Apparently you are all really thorough. Maybe I, I can ask a question then, um, if no one else is about to do that. I don't see anyone raising their hands yet. Please someone correct me if I'm wrong. But maybe Diana, I could ask you, as you mentioned, persons with disabilities have been largely excluded in many ways during the COVID response, whether it's in terms of accessibility of information or otherwise. Are there any particular lessons that you think we really need to take not only from the COVID response, but more generally about how we can ensure that they're not excluded in future. Uh, thank you, Anish, for the question. Um, a big one. I, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the essence, I think, possibly to summarise very briefly, is that if we don't collect, collect data that's sex, age, disability, disaggregated si data, nosotros. And other diversities, we will not be able to no know about data. our communities. Um, if we don't identify the barriers, i.e., our attitudinal, our environmental, institutional barriers, we won't be able to understand the community's needs. And the most Great. important thing is if we don't hear the voices of the people in their 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 community, their accessible ways, we will never understand. Of how we can adapt our programs and, and our responses and that has been very seen very clear no one's in most um, COVID areas has discussed that issue with a person who has diverse needs to know how to adapt even an information that comes in on a piece of paper if you have a visual impairment how do you see it um, if, if it's a loudspeaker and you're deaf how do you hear it so there's really basic simple steps you can put in place but data barriers participation three key steps to inclusion so those would be the key messages i would suggest thank you super thank you very much for that diana there was a question or of a comment in terms of some of the examples about how they relate to the core humanitarian standard commitments for example information sharing with communities, commitments four and five, 
I know that we will be coming back to the core humanitarian standard in the second half of our webinar. But if Schumann or Ilyasu, you have something there that you'd like to raise, please do bring that up. I also have a question now from Nicholas Ross, which is, does the practice of standardization help to slow down humanitarian support? If yes, how can this be mitigated? And we've also got another question for Diana what, from Uni. What concrete actions are needed to use the experiences on access in this pandemic to be converted into policy action or influencing governments? Maybe I could pass the floor back, uh, Schumann or Ilyasu, do you want to maybe right. talk to the question around practice of standardization before I go back to Diana? Right. Thanks, Manisha. Uh, I don't know, Elias, if I may go first, like even before the standardization uh, question, you know, I wanted to uh, address a question about uh, the need for giving timely and correct information to communities. And this has been a particular challenge in COVID because of so much of uh, kind of excess information, a lot of misinformation, a lot of rumors and, 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 and hoaxes and, and all that stuff. So what we realize is a very good way to do it is to engage with uh, uh, local communities, local groups, uh, through a process of dialogue, storytelling, understand where they're coming from, what is the source of these rumors, misconceptions, and then, then pass messages through them and also design our messages in very simple terms in local dialect and and communicate with them. So, so getting this insights from local communities through through the groups was very important. I think that in that sense we were very successful, not just in our Cox's Bazaar intervention, but also in our in the national Bangladesh COVID response that we are support supporting. In terms of uh, standards, of course, uh, the the if I got the question right, if you are raising the standards, it's going to be difficult to meet them and it might slow things down. But, but sphere, sphere standards are really not uh, new in that sense. We have been working around these on these for, for many years back. It's just that the, 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 the scale of the problem has uh, magnified significantly in, in COVID. And we've also had some, some learning from the Ebola response. So of course, I think at the end of the day, uh, kind of in it a lot depends on, on how agile we are, how much you know we can uh, uh, continue to maintain our contacts with communities using various methods through groups or through digital platforms, so that uh, you know we can continue to engage with them and ensure that we can maintain these uh, standards to the maximum extent possible. It is of course challenging, uh, but but that's I think why we are all around uh, to address those uh, challenges and and the sphere standards are a constant reminder what we should aspire for. So, thank Super. You. Thank you very much, Shuman. And Ilyasu, before I pass to you, we've got a few more questions in case you want to pick up on any of these. There was a question about, uh, no, I've lost it, sorry. Do you have any experience of dealing with rumors or fake news through sphere or humanitarian standards? And another one around, how do you know or measure adequacy when you talk about adequate community engagement? Are there any indicators that you use to give at least a sense that you have adequately engaged people and met standards, particularly during COVID times? And there's also another question. I'm just throwing them out there so you can answer the ones you can and then come back uh, around how can you enhance social mobilization efforts to spread awareness messages among communities in low resource settings. Ilyasu, may I pass to you to see if you can tackle some of those, please. Merci, Manisha, and merci pour tous les intervenants pour toutes ces questions très pertinentes. En matière de réponse aux crises, je pense que le précédent orateur l'a dit, les standards doivent être universels et par conséquent, notre effort doit être porté sur comment euh, les étendre à l'ensemble de la communauté qui en a les besoins, conformément, dans tous les cas, à, à nos principes, euh, notamment la charte qui dit que la réponse doit correspondre aux, aux besoins des gens. Maintenant, comment susciter Est-ce qu'on a des, des variables pour mesurer l'engagement communautaire Bien entendu, euh, il faut travailler pour les engager, il faut par conséquent euh, se faire un certain nombre de critères 
en tout cas, pour mesurer dans quelle mesure est-ce que nous sommes allés, en train d'aller avec la communauté ou sur où il faut mettre l'accent de façon à s'assurer qu'à tout moment, nous sommes là en train d'accompagner la communauté plutôt que de tirer la communauté. Et donc, euh, c'est tout à fait normal que euh, dans le cadre des interventions, en particulier cela, il faut travailler euh, pour se faire accepter. Par conséquent, il faut savoir écouter la communauté, comprendre ses préoccupations. Et c'est en ce moment, justement, où on comprendra euh, toute la question des rumeurs, toute la question euh, des mauvaises informations que les gens circulent. Et une fois qu'on les a compris, c'est en ce moment qu'on peut euh, développer sa propre stratégie de communication. Et c'est cela, cette stratégie de communication-là qui devra faire de l'espace aux communautés de façon à ce que nous puissions utiliser les canaux locaux de communication, utiliser des personnes sûres dans la communauté, des personnes qui, lorsqu'elles parlent, les gens les comprennent, les gens les acceptent. Et ce faisant, donc, on va faire passer l'information et se faire mobiliser davantage de membres communautaires par rapport à notre action. Et après, donc, c'est juste un effort de suivi que nous, nous allons faire. Et je pense qu'à un moment donné, les collègues nous disent qu'il faut euh, surtout euh, ne pas se comporter en expert avec la communauté, mais il faut être plutôt quelqu'un qui sait accompagner, qui sait suivre, qui sait donner la bonne information, mais aussi quelqu'un qui met en place un mécanisme permettant de recevoir les retours et de les travailler avec la communauté et de les prendre en compte dans le, le processus. Ce faisant, on garantit la participation communautaire et plus la communauté participe, plus elle voit des résultats, plus ça convainc les autres et, et c'est cela qui est, est quelque part porteur de euh, davantage d'engagement de, communautaire et c'est ça qui soutient aussi l'engagement communautaire. Donc, tout le jeu s'est fait autour pratiquement des principes mais aussi autour euh, des, des engagements de la norme humanitaire fondamentale sur lesquels on reviendra dans la seconde partie. Merci, Manisha. Merci beaucoup, Eliasu. Thank you very much. And Diana, we had that question for you from earlier around what concrete actions are needed to use the experiences on access to be converted into policy action or influence governments. There is also another question around how does the humanitarian sector coordinate and collaborate with central government during a preparedness or response period? And I'm not sure if you want to come back on that one as well, but if you can, that would be great. And there's another question, and I'm going to stop the questions there so that we don't run out of time. There's one around resource mobilization being a big challenge in the context of COVID. How can we effectively engage with donors and with private sector donors? If any of you are able to speak to that, but we can also leave that question for our second session mm -hmm. where we have a panel. But Diana, perhaps I can turn to you. Okay, um, some very interesting questions. So to, to go back, how do we bring the messages to the policy level? Well, um, if we're looking at inclusion lens here, I mean, it, the usual messaging is, do we engage adequately with older people's associations, um, organizations of people with disabilities to be actively engaged with the sector activities that we're doing to, to have that messaging um, ripe so that when we go to policy level, we have an inclusive voice. So it, it's, I would say the thing is, as, as previous speaker, it's all about dialogue. It's having the listening ear, making sure the messages are appropriate to the people who are, are um, needing that support and, and we need to guide guide these messages um, and obviously it's about building relationships um, if we we've got again the same thing if we use the data that we collect effectively to, to uh, demonstrate concrete qualitative and quantitative evidence to, to put that into the um, to, to the community to be able to understand that data and use that to guide their advocacy messaging at policy level, then you've got an informed message. Um, and it, it's, it's a good solid platform to take discussions forward. And that's, that's the approach we, we try and use. And whether it's with an organization or without an engagement, you, uh, an organization, for me, that's the starting point to, to um, mobilize the communities um, to, to recognize who, who's in the community first before you can have the right message. Just a few points, huh? thank you. Super, thank you very much, Diana. I'm gonna see, uh, does uh, Shuman or Ilyasu, did you wanna come back uh, before I close up? Shuman, please, I see your hand. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, so basically, there were two questions. One was about how do we engage with uh, the government on on uh, the policy issue, and second is that uh, within resource uh, poor settings, how do we respond to the staggering need? So uh, what I can share about what we did in in concern worldwide. Uh, we uh, decided right from the beginning that whatever we do in our COVID response, we would align it completely with Bangladesh's National uh, COVID uh, Preparedness and Response Plan (NPRP). Uh, so, and and this this NPRP has eight uh, distinct pillars of which we agreed that we'll support seven pillars, and we had this dialogue right from the beginning with the national government. As well as as the gov as as well as the health department in the in the districts and and local government, as well. So throughout the process, we kept them informed about what we were doing, what challenges we are facing, and and what coordination challenges we are facing, what resource constraints we are facing, so that the resources, so that you know we could complement the resources that were coming from the government and resources that we ourselves had. And we had a lot of a lot of. Problems in terms of we had to import uh, commodities very quickly, and there were restrictions over there. There were many other restrictions, so, we, so it was an issue of constant, regular dialogue with uh, the government and and giving them feedback. Because ultimately, we were supporting their plan, their national plan. We were not doing something in 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 isolation. The other thing is that we kept on sharing data, the progress from the field on what we were doing with them. And with that, we also started sharing the challenges. So this is both at the local level we shared it as well as the national level. So that way, it was very, very kind of uh, it was it was easier for us to get our voices heard with the government and 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 then enable the government to take supportive action and and support us uh, in in the journey. About the resources, of course, resources are 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 limited. Even during normal circumstances, we ha we don't have enough resources. But I must give it to our donors, both. Uh, bilateral donors uh, multilateral donors as well as private donors that all of them got back to us and we do have a big portfolio of donors all of them got back to us and said that uh, that we could repurpose our existing grants and for about 3 to 6 months we could use that money for covid uh, response on top of that there were a few donors who also gave us a top up for for uh, for funding so uh, but still despite that as a as uh, as it was discussed, that resources are always limited, but there are ways by which we can try and synergize so that there is minimum duplication between partners, so that we don't duplicate our work with what the government is working, so that we can leverage through our work uh, resources from the government, because government has also made major outlays of, of expenditure. So through these ways, we have tried to ensure, optimize uh, the deployment of resources, but again, I would say that there's never enough, but we can do a good job out of a bad situation. Thank Super. You. Thank you very much, Yuman. Ilyasu, can I give you the floor if you've got any thoughts on some of those questions around coordination, around dealing with rumors, around dealing with government, uh, sorry, with donors? Ilyasu, if you're speaking, you're on mute, I think. Oui, eh, eh, Manisha, juste un peu eh, par rapport à, à la coordination, eh, les relations avec les services gouvernementaux. Nous avons euh, compris particulièrement dans le cadre de la lutte contre COVID-19 que euh, les principales actions qui portent fruit sont celles-là, en particulier en matière d'action sanitaire, qui consiste à s'aligner, euh, comme l'a dit mon précédent orateur, à s'aligner sur le plan du gouvernement, à se coordonner avec les autres acteurs de façon à ce que la réponse soit complète, mais de façon surtout à euh, éviter de se dupliquer, de se marcher les uns sur les autres, mais aussi surtout de façon à renforcer les systèmes existants. Et cela a été d'un intérêt important dans le cadre du contrôle euh, de la COVID-19, notamment en, en République démocratique euh, du, du Congo. Donc la coordination elle demeure, encore une fois de plus, l'une des clés de euh, la mobilisation de ressources, mais surtout de l'utilisation efficiente des ressources, mais aussi qui soutient quelque part l'engagement communautaire. Voilà ce que je voulais dire, Manisha. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Ilyasu. And thank you very much to our first three panelists. I know that we've still got some other questions, particularly one from Magdalena around communicating with communities, but I'm going to keep that one for our second set of questions and our second set of panelists, if that's okay. 
So huge thanks both to, to Ilyasu, Diana, and Schumann for really giving us some excellent examples of ways that you've dealt with some of the challenges during the COVID response and really engaging communities, coordinating with government and working with donors to make sure that you've been able to have a much better response, but then understanding that many of those lessons are still going to have to be taken forward as we continue to deal with COVID, but also in terms of humanitarian response more generally. And for highlighting the importance of really working with communities and then making sure that responses are in line with humanitarian standards. So a huge thanks to the first part of our webinar panel. And as we transition into the second part, we're going to do another poll. And hopefully you can see it. If you can't, you may need to go to the three buttons at the bottom of your Zoom screen or on your telephone where there is a polling option. And here we'd like to know why do humanitarian standards matter in COVID-19 responses? And here you can pick any of those options that you see there, but if it's either humanitarian agencies strive to meet recognized standards, affected people and communities know what to do, donors allocate adequate funding to meet needs based on standards, standards help the coordination of responses, core standards enable and promote people's dignity, or you may have another reason why you think humanitarian standards matter. And we'd like you to just put what those other reasons are into the chat box so that we can take a look at what you may think are other, other issues or other reasons why humanitarian standards matter. I'll give you a few more minutes to just, uh, or a couple minutes to go through those answers now, and then we'll look at what the results are. So far, the majority is about enabling and promoting people's dignity, which is great. But please do put any other reasons why you think standards are important for COVID-19 responses into the chat box. Or maybe we've covered them all in our poll. Uh, we have one other. Why have standards if you pick and choose when to apply them? I'm not sure I... Professionalization of the sector is another reason why standards matter. Catriona, your other reason for why standards matter your, is, I guess, a more fun fundamental question around why have standards if you pick and choose when to apply them. I, I will come back to that one. Um, we have now our poll results. Oh, I think uh, you're now seeing the results. So the majority see that standards enable and promote people's dignity. The second most popular answer is around helping the coordination of responses. We then have at the same 51% agencies strive to meet recognized humanitarian standards. And we have affected people and communities know what to do. And then we have finally donors allocating adequate funding to meet needs based on standards. And some of the other ones we have are professionalization of the sector because information and aid and aid is a right, not charity the need to maintain minimum standards and camps and enabling quality including compassion dignity and agency essential life-saving support to affected communities and oh, and then katriona thank you for clarifying is that if we think standards matter which they do for many reasons then we need to apply them consistently indeed absolutely um, yes and acceptance from everyone is the other one so there's a great sort of recognition that standards can really help us in terms of enabling, promoting dignity of people, that it really does help to create a better response. And so that is a very nice way to lead us into the second part of our webinar, which is now going to be a panel discussion on global perspectives and local realities. And for that, I will pass over to you, Balwad. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Manisha. And it was very helpful to actually see all the comments and the feedback. And also I wanted to touch on a question that was raised earlier on, which links 
to some of the comments that were made during the poll as well. Uh, and the question was about uh, standardization. Does the practice of standardization slow down humanitarian support? Uh, I would argue that on the other hand, it actually speeds up support because everyone, uh, humanitarians who are responding, communities who are receiving support, donors who are funding it, governments who are leading uh, response as well, all know what's expected of them. So in a sense, it, it speeds up the, the, uh, the, the support itself, but also ensures that there's a, a quality and an accountability element in there as well. So anyway, let me take you into the, the next session where we will expand on some of these thoughts. And having heard how communities have responded to COVID, we now turn our attention to exploring how global perspectives have taken account of and support local realities in the application of humanitarian standards. And we have lined up for you a panel with immense experience and insights, and we will ask them to share their thoughts on some key questions. So let me first of all introduce the panel. Uh, first, we have Linda Duhl, who is the Global Health Cluster Coordinator with the World Health Organization. Uh, she has over 25 years international health and humanitarian sector experience, having worked with Medical Aid for Palestinians, Médecins Sans Frontières, and Merlin. Linda took up her current role in 2014 and is responsible for overall coordination and strategic direction of one of the leading global partnerships for humanitarian health with 30 active health clusters and 900 partners. Thank you for joining us, uh, Linda. Our next panelist is Alan Karma. Uh, Alan is the Global Humanitarian Coordinator with LWF World Service. He's also the global CHS focal point for LWF and also serves on the CHS Alliance Board. He has more than 24 years experience in the humanitarian and development sector. Alan has dedicated his professional life to strengthen humanitarian development peace linkages through a rights-based approach with a focus on accountability to affected populations. Thanks for joining us, Alan. Next, we have Tanya Wood. Tanya is the executive director of the CHS Alliance, a network of more than 150 organizations that make, uh, make aid work better through the application of the core humanitarian standard. She brings more than 20 years leadership experience in the humanitarian sector across Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Passionate about improving collective efforts, she worked with a range of international membership organizations before joining the CHS Alliance. Welcome, Tanya. And finally, uh, we have Aninia Nadik. Aninia is the policy and practice lead at Sphere, and she joined Sphere in 2008. She also coordinates the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, which is hosted by Sphere. Aninia was closely involved in the 2018 Sphere Handbook revision. Previously, she worked on interna inter internal di displacement, refugee and asylum policy issues, and all she also has a background in political science and international relations and she speaks five languages in addition to English. <laughs> Thanks for joining us as well, Aninia. I'm gonna take, uh, you know, take, go, go down the panel and, and ask you one or two questions each. And, and if you can take a, a minute to respond to the questions, that'd be very helpful. So Linda, let me start with you. Now the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan, which was revised in May of this year, added a reference to the importance of sphere and humanitarian standards. Can you tell us how this has promoted adherence to an, an application of sphere and other humanitarian standards and what more needs to be in place and how? Over to you, Linda. Okay, thank you, uh, Balwant, and greetings to everybody online, good to join you. Um, okay, so big question. Uh, so let's start at the top. So improving quality of humanitarian assistance has been a continual goal for the humanitarian community for many, many years now, the development of SPHERE, other interagency policies and guidance, uh, including AEP, PESA, protection, and other guidance commitments, including CHS. So it, we're not without our, our standards. I think, however, um, reflecting it in the GHRP was, it was a reminder to us all that regardless of the scale or type of crisis that we are responding to, that all assistance and services provided must meet the needs of the affected people and also be delivered to the required standard, whether regardless of which actor is providing those services. So as has already been stated by previous speakers, COVID was very new to everyone. It required 
everybody to rapidly adapt to not only their own needs, but also population needs they were serving. We had major operational challenges, shortages, etc. So de facto, it, it meant that we had to deal with new issues that we had never dealt with before. And the question has to be, how could we apply standards? Were those standards relevant in that context? And similarly, the imposition of public health and social measures, while they were a bit of a double-edged sword in that they may have slowed transmission, but had a negative impact on many of the populations they were already working with, particularly women, IDPs, migrants who had mobilization, uh, mobility curtailed, or were unable to access or utilize health services. So from a global health, health cluster perspective, it allowed us to reiterate the need to use that um, accountability lens to remind us of the consequence of any actions that we took. Um, and, um, and discuss that and, and encourage our colleagues at country level to be able to address needs and maintain standards at the same time. So how did we do that? Well, one, through the existing Global Health Cluster Standards uh, guidance on quality of care in humanitarian settings. Um, we were sure that the interrelated domains had to be considered in any of the response plans that the cluster was developing. So the response must be people-centered, it must be safe, equitable, effective, timely, integrated and efficient, and that those actions need to complement existing key obligations that we have within the humanitarian um, operations. So all that have already been mentioned, for example, humanitarian principles, AEP, centrality of protection, and particularly around health issues, medical ethics. And this last issue was particularly challenging for us. I think our teams on the ground, and I see colleagues online who may wish to comment, the challenge for them was to be able to um, identify and address the kind of key technical issues required and operational requirements to provide an effective response and how to adapt that to their local context, which may be different even in a, in a single country or across a single um, uh, cluster operation. And that required some very difficult decisions on how to, in the, in the face of often shortages of key materials and items in the early days of response, and in fact, even now, how to address dilemmas and make decisions about how to, re, to allocate uh, um, scarce resources in these low resource uh, settings, and to make sure that we fully understand our obligations to those who cannot access some of those settings. So rather than abandoning particular types of population, having an understanding that in multiple settings, we may have to take different approaches. And that to, to for that to be acceptable, it obviously required the community, local community to be involved in that process. So at the global level, in some ways, we have the easy bit to develop and uh, reiterate what the uh, standards are. But at the country level, the challenge was for colleagues on the ground and the 900 partners I work with was to adapt, be able to adapt and apply the many, many new sets of technical guidance and standards for COVID that were out there and how to apply that in a kind of uh, fair and uh, equitable manner. I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Linda. I know it was a big question, but I think you, you gave us a very, very useful and clear response to that. I'll, I'll come to Ellen next, because I think it's in some ways related. Now, Ellen, you work with a global network of members and partners. What has been their biggest uh, challenge in delivering effective responses? And if you could also tell us a bit about the solutions that they may have deployed. Yeah, thank you, Balwant, and thank you, Sphere, for, um, for having us, uh, the Lutheran World Federation, into this panel. Um, it's quite a timely end to your series of webinars, considering that it's now been two years since the last revision of the Sphere standards. So congratulations to the Sphere team. Uh, it's been two years. I see some of your technical panel on the participants list, so this is great. Um, in terms of like, I think some of this have already been mentioned by, you know, my colleagues already, like the main problems that we've heard coming from the field um, during this full COVID response, primarily was on access restrictions. You know, the fact that we were not able to engage with the communities that we work in in the more traditional forms that we were used to. Um, and I think what this did was it highlighted deficiencies in our mechanisms in engaging with the communities we work with. As Diana mentioned, like it's important to ensure inclusion, but if you haven't ensured inclusion during the time when you had direct access to the communities, this was sort of like a huge problem now that you cannot access those communities. Um, 
there was a lot of misinformation as well. I think Shimon mentioned that. There was a lot of misinformation, especially in Asia, in Africa, during the first parts of the uh, first stages of the pandemic, trying to figure out like how to respond to this, uh, this, this issue with, at the same time, trying to, uh, well, trying to give the right information while we are also trying to figure out how this, this all is. It's sort of like flying a plane while building it um, at the same time. So I think there was a lot of changes in the information that is coming out um, from different agencies. And of course that has created confusion. And then there are those who, who basically are just going for misinformation. Um, there's a lot of issues with program, program implementation, obviously. Um, and I think as mentioned by one of the speakers earlier, there was a higher case, of course, of sexual and gender-based violence. And one of the reasons is, of course, um, attributed to this is this, uh, this issues of confinement. Um, and so with all these issues and you don't have access to the communities that you work with, there was a lot of solutions that our country programs have tried to come up with. But all of these were anchored on existing mechanisms or mechanisms, community-based mechanisms, that were already there prior to this particular pandemic. Um, so we had community-based organizations, we had incentive staff, which are basically refugees themselves who are part of our team and who have actually helped us because they were engaged and they were actually in the communities. They were able to engage continuously with you know, the community themselves. We also used alternatives as some of you may have done so, like uh, using the radio for information sharing or SMS. Another huge issue or challenge that we had during this particular period was what Linda has mentioned. How do we adapt to this particular situation and adapting to the situation on so many different levels? Um, she mentioned the technical aspect of it, um, but generally it, it's, it's everything that we do. Um, the way that we do things um, has had to change because of this pandemic. Now, the standards have been there and they were good. And just to say the standards don't change is how we implement and approach um, the way we deal with communities that has to change, the mechanisms surrounding it. Um, and the thing is like most of the mechanisms that we had in implementing the standards are more leaning towards face-to-face -to -face, you know, um, interactions. And a solution that came out was of course, a lot of guidance is coming from the IASC, which was really, really helpful. Um, coming from headquarters of agencies and other NGOs. The problem is, again, as Linda also mentioned already, there was too much, um, especially in the months, the first few months, which are coming out, all of these agencies coming up with guidances to adapt to different mechanisms and, and different situations that, uh, that our uh, country teams are facing, which could have been helpful, but the problem is because there's too much, it was very difficult, for example, for country programs, sub-office, local NGOs possibly, to sort of synthesize and understand what exactly is the guidance. And with updates coming up to the version every two weeks, three weeks or so, it probably created a lot more confusion in, in a lot of these cases. And this is something that I think needs to be looked at in how we actually do it. Sure, for INGOs, a lot of their HQs did the synthesizing for them. And a lot of um, effort has been done by networks such as ICBA as well, and trying to sort of like synthesize the information, but how about those who are not connected at the global level? I think we need to make sure that the guidances that we, we release are actually relevant and do not cause any further confusion. Engaging with traditional, non-traditional partners was also a big issue. Um, there was a lot of, for those of you, for those agencies who were not used to dealing with governments, this was the time when you had to deal with governments. And, and that's one thing that, uh, that has to be done. Last two issues that I think uh, were very much prevalent uh, during this particular issue was a uh, uh, pandemic was the issue on funding flexibility. So a lot of the projects at the ground level, we've been having problems because we couldn't implement it and we needed a greater deal of flexibility from donors. So the solution related to that one was really just speaking to the donors and telling them. And for the most part, this actually worked and we, I think what happens sometimes is this disconnect between what HQ says and what sub offices actually do. And um, finally, it's the ensuring of duty of care. This has been and continues to be a strong challenge uh, for LWF. Like how do you ensure that we take care of our staff who are taking care of the work that we're doing on the ground? Um, and this particularly true for, for local staff. 
a lot of the guidance coming out from agencies do cover international staff, but we need to focus more on how do we protect uh, local staff. For us, um, we ensured inclusive guidance. We had staff rotation options, both for local and international staff, but more importantly, which we found useful is psychosocial support. But I think overall, the biggest issue is that not all solutions can apply. You know, as uh, Diana mentioned, blanket solutions don't work. And in this particular case, um, that's exactly what it is. The situation changes based on context and not all situations applied to communities can be applied to refugee settings like what was mentioned earlier. So it was sort of like making us think on our toes. Um, and as I said, building the, the, the plane while we're flying it. Um, but I guess to me, like the standard was a good way to sort of like anchor all of these discussions. As long as we know what the main standard is, um, approaches, mechanisms, and whatever we do, uh, is based on those particular standards. And I think that that was really, really important for LWF. Over to you, Balwan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for a very comprehensive response. Uh, we may come back to some questions related to that. Uh, let me now turn to Tanya. Uh, Tanya, can you share with us uh, how the core humanitarian standard uh, has supported people affected by this particular crisis and maybe also add how uh, the CHS has enabled organizations to deliver effective responses. Thanks, Balwent, and many thanks to Sphere for organizing this webinar and uh, gathering so many people together. Great to be here. I think for the CHS, the main point that we never can stress enough is it is the core standard. And that means that it outlines the essential elements of principled and effective aid. And also the most powerful thing I think around the CHS was that it was written as a set of commitments that the sector is making to people affected by crisis. But, and I think we've recognized this for a while, but maybe COVID accelerated this was while the intention is there that these are written as a set of commitments, they're not that accessible. Um, we've heard a lot during this webinar about accessibility. They weren't accessible to people. So at the beginning of this crisis, we've turned them into plain language and we have a set of plain language CHS with the intention that we've asked our members and we're continuing to plead uh, that organizations put these up so that they are accessible to people. And why is this important? Well, the intention of the CHS was that if people knew what they can expect, then they might be able to hold the agencies to account. So that um, push of COVID with the sort of the, the nervousness about people being in confinement was around this accessibility of people knowing and understanding their rights. In terms of maybe going into, so that's a sort of more general ethos, but if we go into maybe some of the more, um, maybe the more technical areas or a couple to highlight around how COVID has changed, um, I saw in maybe it answers Randini's question and certainly echoes what Alan was just saying, is one of the areas in the CHS, one of the commitments, commitment five, which is around complaints are welcomed and addressed, is our, well, I think our failing commitment. It's the one that we are, our CHS data shows that we consistently underperform on as a sector, and we continue to see that with uh, the reports and the constant reports that we hear of the most sort of serious form of abuse when people aren't able to complain. So obviously with the confinement that people were put under and this lack of being able to connect with people, we were very concerned about how this would impact on, on complaint mechanisms. So we've just finalized a study that looks at this and the results aren't surprising to anyone, but again, um, we, we know it, but what can we do about it? Um, over half of the people who engaged in that study said their complaint mechanism had been kind of negatively affected because as Alan just uh, said, they were built on face-to-face. -face. And so we were really struggling to change that into um, a means of more remote versions. And I hope we will learn from, from this COVID example of not going from one to the other, but how could 
And then um, it's been highlighted, but our concern is, and what this report says, is that the number of complaints around sexual exploitation and abuse or harassment dropped significantly. And I don't think any of us on this line would expect that that wasn't because those were incidents weren't happening, but we aren't hearing about them. And then if I may, Belle, went just my very final point, because I don't think we've touched on it um, too much, although maybe Alan just raised it before, is one of the core areas of the CHS is the belief that to be able to assist people well, we need to be able to look after our workforce and the staff who support them. And so obviously what we're seeing is huge changes in how we work in a parallel Zoom world right now, we're having the humanitarian HR conference where a strong message is it's not about when we go back to normal, it's about adapting to the new normal. And I think um, where there's a lot of opportunities and challenges, challenges, really incredible challenges around duty of care, protecting our staff, but also how do you look after their well being when you don't see them regularly? But also, I think some, maybe to end on a positive note, some opportunities around more flexible working, maybe reducing some of our incessant travel, and hopefully maybe a real push or maybe even the kick that we needed to more localized and uh, nationalized uh, humanitarian response. So those are just a few of the elements to, to highlight. Thanks, Balwint. Thank you very much indeed, Tanya. I particularly like, I think, the what you referred to in terms of the uh, adapting to, I guess, not just new normality, but changing normality, because it, it seems like that's going to be the, the, the way forward. Uh, on that note, let me invite uh, Aninia to add to that as well, to tell us a little bit about how sphere standards, uh, you know, can be applied in different local contexts and realities, and maybe also touch on, on how this happens in, in very different urban and rural contexts as well. Uh, Aninia, over to you. Uh, I think you're muted, Aninia. I was. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, I was saying thank you, Balwant, for the question and the fact that the contextualization has probably been the most challenging element uh, for Sphere over the past uh, 20 years of its existence. And um, we've talked about contextualization numerous times now during this webinar. And um, I would like to just take a very, very short detour and go to, back to the very beginning of Sphere when the standards were published for the first time. And a group of uh, French NGOs wrote a letter to Sphere uh, outlining three problems they saw with the standards, which was one, that they were not um, adaptable enough to specific contexts, two, that they would, the risk was that organizations would get bogged down in bureaucracy to apply to these standards, and three, that they would give, the standards would give a certain degree of control of, by donors of, of NGOs, Northern NGOs, and then Northern would, would pass on that control to Southern NGOs. And I think that we are, that um, those concerns are still there. We heard some of them today. And Sphere has, over the past 20 years, made consistent efforts to make the standards more contextualizable or to bring across the message of contextualizing. And we've heard it before. Alan said it. The way you contextualize a global standard is by understanding the difference between the standard, which is um, a, a, a qualitative outcome statement of a right, and then the indicators that help you um, measure that and that you can um, um, adapt to, to context as need be according to, your, to um, what you can deliver to uh, limitations and so forth. And um, yet, 
there continues to be this frustration that people can either not reach a sphere indicator or they feel or they feel that their particular context is is not conducive to working with standards. Um, so the key message is don't be discouraged and use the indicators also as something aspirational to work towards. And the other element I wanted to say is that over time, Sphere really has put increasing focus on context, for example, through strengthening themes that focus on local realities, including protection, psychosocial, spiritual support, and the inclusion of various um, at-risk groups. And this edition also has different uh, indicators. We reshape the indicators to make contextualization easier. And to bring that element to a, a concrete example, the um, urban contextualization, that also urban elements are stronger in the handbook now. Simply, my message is, and I will probably stop right there, all standards, since they express a right, are also applicable to urban uh, situations. Some indicators may not be useful, like, I don't know, or, or guidance, how to dig a borehole or how, how long you have to wait in line to access your water. But speaking of water, the right to a sufficient um, and affordable quantity of water is the same in urban or rural situations. And um, the other thing is that all those rights-based elements, the, the humanitarian charter protection, um, the elements of the core humanitarian uh, standard, those commitments apply equally, obviously, in urban situations. And that's where every time standards need to be looked at, not just from their technical indicator point of view, but really from their globality as an expression of rights. And I'll stop there. Super. Thank you very much, Anina. Um, and thank you to all our panelists. We had expected this to be a bit of a quicker round of questions and answers. So I'm going to now combine some of the other questions we had planned for our panelists with some of the many questions that are coming in through the chat box and also by email. So I'm going to just read out a few of the questions that are coming in. Some are quite big ones, so I'm just going to group them a little bit. There had already been a bit of conversation around the challenges of communicating with communities. But if anybody is able to come back on what are some of the strategies developed to com collect complaints and feedback on issues of violence or violations of the rights of people in quarantine situations, particularly from the most vulnerable groups such as children, people with disabilities or women. Another question was really around the huge challenge of implementing sphere standards. And if there's any communication plan with donors on the need to increase support more than ever. And maybe Linda, that's something I can come back to you on. Also a question around, will any of this kind of response on COVID have an impact on the updating of standards? And we've also got another one and it falls into what was said earlier around the plain language of the CHS that Tanya mentioned. For local NGOs, transforming standards into all staff and into the community is a big challenge because of the various levels of education, interest, or commitment. So is there any suggestions about, about how to ever overcome those challenges? Sorry. We've also got another one around the question about how does localization and the empowerment of local and national responders play into the COVID response? We should have been talking about localization since the grand bargain. Are there more things that can be done? And COVID has also presented a, a huge opportunity to test our standards. Which ones were reinforced and strengthened? Do we need to jettison any that were not relevant or have greater alignment? And that was actually a question I believe that we had lined up for one of you in advance. So maybe I can go back to you, Linda, sort of in terms of sort of, you know, how do we work better with local actors and ensure effective coordination across all actors? Do you have any thoughts on that or and any other last words before I go quickly to the next panelist? I know we're asking big questions, but I'm going to ask everyone to keep their answers to a minute or so, please. Thanks, Linda. 
Thanks, uh, Manisha. So on coordination, I think what was very clear from the outset of the COVID response, a uh, very clear uh, agreement between the emergency relief coordinator and the, the country offices and respective government was to build on existing coordination mechanisms to not start uh, developing parallel systems. Now, and these were lessons learned from some previous outbreaks. Now, to some extent, that's been helpful because people know how to engage, but we know perfectly well that at the sub-national level, the sub-sub-national level, the local level where really this response uh, needs to be fully focused, that that's often the weakest part of the coordination. It's often not particularly resourced by the international community and perhaps local partners are not as engaged um, as they are, often not through lack of desire, but lack of resources to do that. So I do think moving forward, the success of the COVID response moving forward will be based on localization and adaptation. So there is a need to um, strengthen that inclusive locally led coordination at the sub sub national level and for resources to be uh, provided to support that. And that I think at a, it's also from a sort of multi sectoral perspective as well. I think um, that has been perhaps better applied in COVID than it has in other responses, but it's been a huge, a huge learning curve on many fronts. But again, how can we encourage and replicate that at the most local level where you know, you can see what's happening with COVID. It's local uh, upticks in different countries and different parts of countries. So while you need an overarching coordination incident management team that we're all engaging in a multi-sectoral way, this really has to be strengthened at the localist level. Okay. Super. Thank you so much, Linda. Alan, if I can turn to you and that question around what standards have become re not relevant or need to be jettisoned, what would you also recommend are some measures for harmonizing humanitarian standards for the users so that it is easier for people to, to use those? Thanks, Manisha. I think uh, if, before I go into that, I think um, standards have played quite an important role in as far as this crisis is concerned. If, if you think about it, like um, when all else fails and you're all alone, if you, have an understanding of what the standards are, both as a person um, receiving uh, uh, or working as an NGO or the communities we serve in, then you have the standards to re rely on. To. Um, I think CHS is all about empowering communities and the commitments that we have there is about how do we make sure that they are listened to, as Aliesu mentioned, and Sphere is about ensuring the standard and providing quality service and knowing what they should expect. Um, and I think the frustration is, of course, on accessibility of this standard. So in terms of what to jettison, I don't think there is anything to jettison. In fact, I think we're beginning to understand where the weaknesses are in terms of what the, the commitments that we have, whether it's in the indicators, whether it's in the accessibility of language, whether it's in the way that we made people understand. I think one of the um, participants, Iqbal Adin, mentioned that you know, we have communities of different levels of education. How do we make sure they understand? So what what happened was we sort of identified what the problems are with the standards that we have. Um, but another thing, as I said, again, it's not about jettisoning the existing standard because I think it's there. Like it's, it's, it's the product of years and years of discussions amongst us humanitarian actors. And I think there's a lot of it in there and I don't, I'm not calling for a huge sort of like, a, a, what's the word? Um, um, Overhaul? Uh, overall of the digital process. But I think it's about preparedness and important to ensure understanding and implementation prior to emergencies. You know, when I moved from the development sector to humanitarian sector, one of my frustrations was, why are we only talking about preparedness and, and standards when the actual crisis is already there? We need to be better at preparing about all of these things. Um, what has worked in our programs and with, it's when our programs and the communities we work with are familiar with the standards, they know what to do, they know what to expect, so that when the crisis actually happens, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's easier. Community level structures are very important. This is one of the things that the CHS is trying to say, like we need to build up on existing mechanisms, complaints mechanisms, for example. When your existing organizational complaint mechanisms don't work, it's probably because it was not built into the existing mechanisms in the community. One thing that we've seen working in refugee camps and in communities is when we build on existing complaints mechanism and strengthen those, 
then when the NGOs were not able to access, then they just continue doing what, what, what's happening at, at that particular point. Um, at a certain point, there has to be a level of trust between the organizations and the communities we serve. And that can only be achieved if you all agree on a, a common understanding of what the standards are and what needs to be delivered. Thanks, Munisha. Super, thank you very much, Alan. Tanya, maybe you could touch upon a little bit around how, what are some of the remaining challenges around using the CHS to deliver responses effectively in COVID, but maybe also a little bit around that point around communicating with communities and how has it been possible to collect complaints from those who may be more vulnerable in, in communities? Thanks, Manisha. I'll be quick. I think the main challenge for the, the CHS is, is probably, in a way, what Alan summed up just now. It's around the sort of accessibility of it. We are the younger, the younger cousin of Sphere. Um, it's still a newish standard, and yet its very premise works on it'll work as a core standard if we get everyone applying it. And we know, and we've got a long way to go on trying to get far more local NGOs really working where the humanitarian system is responding to really look at how the CHS is being applied there and measured and, and learned from rather than what we've taken at the moment, which is quite an organizational perspective. And, and that's a journey that, that we're going on. Um, we have to do, but the ultimate goal is trying to get that kind of the, the people themselves to be able to uphold and hold us accountable. And I think we all recognize we've got a long journey to go on to get there. Super, thank you very much. And finally, Aninya, one last sentence in terms of sort of what is it around standards that we need to think about a little bit more learning from COVID and moving ahead and, you know, it, in that sort of, are there things from your view that need to be jettisoned or changed or anything as a last thought from your side before we turn to our last speaker, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, nothing jettisoned yet. I will be premature to, to um, the, the verdict is still, jury is still out. I think one standard that works really well is WASH standard six, and that is a collaboration between the WASH and health sectors um uh, bringing those those things together really focusing on community engagement which is also in the wash sector wash standard um chapter and in others is really important and um i see the uh, contribution of standards really to help streamline and focus um on what is important in all this additional guidance that has been produced now and uh, that we've also talked about today and I'm presuming that the next sphere handbook revision will be a great opportunity to, to really, I don't want to say weed out, but to really focus on, on, on consolidating that, um, that new guidance and bring it into a, a, a shorter, bring it into the next handbook. Thank you. Super, thank you. And a huge thanks to our panelists and for all the great questions. Apologies, we haven't been able to get to all of them but we will save the chat and ch pass those on. I'm going to pass quickly to Balwant and I apologize to our interpreters that we're running a little over time. Balwant, please. Thank you very much, Manisha. And I hope all of you will stay with us for another five to seven minutes. Uh, in this closing session, we are very pleased to have Dr. Uni Krishnan uh, join us to share his reflections on why humanitarian standards matter. Uni is the humanitarian director with War Child and for over two decades, he has worked on humanitarian development and health issues in senior management leadership, representational governance and advisory positions uh, for humanitarian and development agencies. Um, he was also co-author of the health chapter of the 2018 Sphere Handbook and previously chair of the board of Sphere. Uni, I'm delighted to invite you to share some of your final closing reflections with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Balban. Good day, everyone. Actually, listening to uh, various speakers and the audience comments makes me believe that this is a great time to discuss humanitarian standards. So good job, Sphere team, and thank you for inviting me. So to prepare for this uh, webinar, I spoke to community practitioners and advocates of humanitarian standards, both 
internally in Barchild as well as with others in the sector, I actually learned three things. Firstly, humanitarian standards are coming up more frequently in community level discussions. Secondly, dominant aspects of the crisis are receiving better attention. And so are the standards associated with them. On the top of my list are, it's not a final or a conclusive list, but uh, on the top of my list are protection and child protection, health and hygiene, education, and cash. Thirdly, the proactive promotion of specific guidelines and standards is shining a better spotlight on standards. So two specific examples are, again, uh, this is not a final list, but this is what I heard listening to colleagues and others in the sector. The first one is about child safeguarding and protection standards to, to tackle the amplified risks associated with the online learning and social media platforms uh, promoted by the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. And the second one being, there was already a reference to this, the mental health and psychosocial support promoted by the IAC reference group. In fact, the first one that is child protection is also seeing better synergy with education standards. Remember the millions of children who are out of schools. So why are standards getting better attention now? One reason, just one reason being, but I believe it's an important reason, the response to the pandemic is more local than in other crisis settings, diminishing the borders between the community and community workers. This makes a stronger case to place crisis affected people and their dignity, which was voted as the number one purpose of the standards and caring of carers, especially local frontline workers, at the heart of all initiatives. The standards are also inseparable from the bigger issues affecting the humanity during a global humanitarian crisis. So a key question that Balwand and Manisha suggested me to address is what lies ahead in 2021 and beyond, and how can humanitarian standards contribute, especially when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines? 2021, prediction. So I believe the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So COVID-19 will not be over for anyone until it is over for everyone. So let's look at the ethical challenge of getting vaccines to all. It's a big challenge. So firstly, availability has never resulted in accessibility and affordability automatically. Huge costs and so on. Secondly, who will politicians and decision makers prioritize first? Will they prioritize bankers and stock exchange brokers and those who are more economically productive than others? and what considerations they will give for vulnerable sections of the society. The Sphere Handbook does not make any direct reference to COVID-19 vaccine or about bankers and stock traders. However, the Humanitarian Charter makes a clear reference to a fundamental principle of non-discrimination that no one should be discriminated against on any grounds of status. This principle should inform a policy framework to ensure equitable access to vaccines. Bigger and widespread the crisis, so is the need to have a stronger foundation for our work, foundations built on human values such as compassion and collaboration and humanitarian principles and fundamental human rights. All are useful tools for decision makers. So finally, our leaders tell us that COVID-19 pandemic is a big storm and we are all in this together. The pandemic may be a big storm, but I believe different people are traveling on different boats. Some boats are shaky and broken, and so are the passengers on such boats and they are extremely vulnerable, such as refugees, elderly, children, and migrant workers. The key point being, there are no winners if we leave anyone behind. And I believe the humanitarian standards can go a long way to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you for listening. Unni, thank you very much indeed. I thought your message was very powerful, particularly the message about uh, you know, the pandemic is not over for anyone until it is over for everyone, because I think that's a key message about equity, about access, about accessibility, which are many of the strands that came out earlier as well. So thank you very much indeed um, for, for your thoughts. Uh, now, I just would like to, to take a few minutes, I think, just to offer some, some thanks as well. But also just to say that, you know, early in the pandemic, I was asked to speak on humanitarian organizations and resilience, and it made me reflect on human nature. Um, and I, you know, when, when we're confronted with ambiguity, anxiety, worrying news or overwhelming circumstances, which is what has been the case with the pandemic, we go into a, a stage which is called what I call unproductive uncertainty, because we are 
you know, overwhelmed with stuff. We're not sure what's going on and it affects our productivity as well. As we begin to make sense of what we can do and how we can help, we develop what I call is uncertain capability. So even though circumstances are very uncertain, we build on our cap capability and we draw on our resilience to make sure things begin to happen. And then we start reframing things, reframing what seems impossible initially. And this is where humanitarian standards really come in. So when you use humanitarian standards and put them into practice, they actually lead to a, a stage where you get productive certainty. So what, I, what do I mean by this? People who need assistance and help receive it. Uh, they know what they can expect and what they receive. Those who are delivering it also know what's expected of them. So I just wanted to, to end by suggesting that what might be helpful as we go into 2021 and beyond in relation to the pandemic, we begin to, to start reframing things. And I want to go back to also what Tanya said earlier on. You know, it's about there isn't going to be a new normality. We've got to keep on adapting to a changing normality as well. So on behalf of Sphere and our partners, the CHS Alliance, the Humanitarian Standards Partnership, ASB, and many others, I would like to thank all the facilitators of all seven webinars, all the speakers we have been very fortunate to have, all the participants who have taken your time to share your invaluable experience, thoughts, questions, and comments, and also importantly for listening. In addition, I would like to uh, give a huge thanks to my incredible team at Sphere, uh, and also the very talented and huge team of captioners, uh, uh, sign language interpreters, simultaneous language interpreters, who have just worked incredibly hard to deliver this series of webinars to a huge global audience. Finally, a very big thank you to Manisha for coordinating with such flair this initiative, not just this webinar, uh, and also to Jonathan Burton, who has volunteered a huge amount of his time and expertise to make sure all our webinars work well also. Now, before we end, I'd like to please ask you to take a bit of time to fill up the evaluation form. It's really helpful for us in terms of learning. Uh, we will listen to what you've said and anything that we deliver in the future, we will use uh, any of the learnings we have and apply it there as well. So once again, a very big thank you to all and I wish you a very good morning or a good afternoon or a good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.